Hi, I'm Dave Stotts from Drive Through History. Happy St. Valentine's Day. We all know the version of St. Valentine's Day that we celebrate in America these days. February 14th, the date on the calendar to send a card, chocolate and flowers to someone we're romantically interested in. But what's the history surrounding the first St. Valentine's Day? Who was St. Valentine anyway? To get an answer, I traveled to Dublin, Ireland to start my quest. At least three different martyrs for Christianity named Valentine were granted sainthood in the Roman Catholic Church. Collectively, they were given February 14th as their feast day, going back as far as the third century. February 14th is also celebrated as St. Valentine's Day in other Christian denominations. For instance, it's a commemoration day in the calendar of saints in the Anglican communion and a feast day in the calendar of saints of the Lutheran Church. I've traveled here to Dublin, Ireland to learn a bit more about the Christian history related to St. Valentine's Day. According to tradition, one of the best known stories about St. Valentine comes from Europe during the third century. The Roman Empire had been at war for many years. Its power was declining, especially its military, and more and more soldiers were deserting. In fact, many young men stopped signing up for the army altogether. According to the Roman Emperor at the time, Claude II, prospective soldiers were more interested in women and having families than in fighting for the empire. In an effort to solve the problem, cruel Claude, as he was then nicknamed, simply outlawed weddings throughout his realm. But a priest named Valentine decided to defy the Emperor's decree. In secret, he encouraged young lovers to meet him so they could be blessed with a wedding and the sacrament of marriage in the church. Eventually, Claude heard about these secret weddings and put Valentine in jail. There, the priest befriended the blind daughter of his prison guard. In the end, Valentine was sentenced to death. According to tradition, right before his execution on February 14th in the year 270, he prayed for the blind girl and she received her sight. He also gave her a heart-shaped letter with a blessing signed from your Valentine. When the Roman Empire collapsed at the end of the 5th century, Valentine was declared a saint by the Catholic Church for his sacrifice in the defense of love and the sacrament of marriage. Although some of this history is based in tradition, it's a great story that supports the establishment of St. Valentine's Day as a religious feast day on February 14th. This is Whitefriars Street Church in Dublin. It's a Roman Catholic church maintained by the Carmelite order. I'm here because Whitefriars Street Church is noted for having the bones of one of the St. Valentines. They were donated to the church in the 19th century by Pope Gregory XVI and moved here from their previous location at a cemetery in Rome. Although St. Valentine's Day was first established as a feast day in the Catholic calendar of saints, it was removed from the general church calendar in 1969 and relegated to local church calendars. The stated reason, quote, though the memorial of St. Valentine is ancient, it is left to particular calendars since apart from his name, nothing is really known of St. Valentine except that he was buried in Rome on February 14th.
So there you have it, the basic church history related to St. Valentine's Day. But when did the celebration of February 14th take on romantic connotations in the general culture? It appears the modern customs related to Valentine's Day go back to Britain in the Middle Ages when people viewed February 14th, which is halfway through the second month of the year, as the day that birds started finding their mates for the upcoming spring. In about 1382, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote a 700-line poem called The Parliament of Fowls. In it, he made the first known literary connection between St. Valentine's Day and the day birds pair up for the season. For this was sent on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl cometh there to choose his mate. Over the next two centuries in Europe, lovers that courted on February 14th started calling themselves their Valentine. By the 16th century, St. Valentine's Day in the church had also become a day specially consecrated to lovers for the sending of cards, letters, and poems. Over the years, Valentine's went from handmade notes to big business. In 1910, 18-year-old Joyce Clyde Hall stepped off the train in Kansas City, Missouri with two shoeboxes full of postcards. Hall had little money, but a huge entrepreneurial spirit. His brother, Ronnie Hall, soon joined in the family business and they named their company Hall Brothers. In 1915, a fire destroyed their office and all their inventory, but they pressed forward with a $17,000 loan and a new strategy. The postcard business was in decline because people wanted more privacy in their communications. So the Hall brothers bought a printing press and started making high quality Valentine's and Christmas cards mailed in envelopes. The plan worked. The brand name was changed to Hallmark and the rest is history. While I've been guilty of buying a commercialized card at the last minute, my mother taught me better than that. So. This year, I'm determined to score some extra points with my wife and make my Valentine from scratch. Perfect. Oh, she's gonna love it. Way better than last year. In addition to Valentine's cards, there are two other traditional gifts that make the top of the list each year, chocolate and flowers. Again, similar to the card, I'm guilty of running to the grocery store at the last minute to grab a bouquet of roses and a heart-shaped box of chocolates. But I've never really thought this through. Am I doing this right? Maybe I need a little more appreciation for these traditions. I mean, where do these traditions come from anyway? Well, this is drive through history. So let's hit the road and explore the backstories for these Valentine's Day staples. First stop, Hershey, Pennsylvania for, you guessed it, the story of chocolate. The history of chocolate began in Mesoamerica in about 450 BC, when the Aztecs made fermented beverages from cacao seeds. Originally prepared only as a drink, chocolate was served as a bitter liquid mixed with spices or corn puree. Chocolate was believed to be an aphrodisiac and to give the drinker strength. Cacao seeds were considered the gift of Quetzalcoatl, the god of wisdom and the seeds once had so much value that they were used as a form of money. After chocolate arrived in Europe in the 16th century, sugar was added and it became popular throughout society, first among the ruling classes and then among the common people. In Britain, Richard Cadbury was the first to improve the chocolate making technique so as to extract pure cocoa butter from whole beans. This resulted in a sweeter, smoother, drinking chocolate. The process also resulted in an excess amount of cocoa butter, which Cadbury used to produce what he called eating chocolate. Richard Cadbury then jumped on a great marketing idea for his new chocolates. 
sell them in beautifully decorated boxes. For Valentine's Day, Cadbury used the familiar images of cupids and roses and put them on boxes. While Richard Cadbury didn't patent the heart-shaped box, it's widely believed that he was the first to make them. Cadbury marketed the boxes for a dual purpose. When the chocolates were gone, the box itself was so pretty that it could be used to store mementos, from love letters to locks of hair. Cadbury's boxes grew increasingly elaborate until the outbreak of World War II, when sugar was rationed and Valentine's Day celebrations were scaled down. But early Cadbury boxes still exist, and many are treasured as valuable collector's items. In America, at the end of the 19th century, Milton Hershey sold his caramel business and acquired Pennsylvania farmland about 30 miles northwest of Lancaster. There he could obtain the large supplies of fresh milk needed to perfect and produce fine milk chocolate. Through trial and error, he created his own formula and made the first Hershey bar in 1900. In 1903, Milton Hershey began construction on what was to become the world's largest chocolate manufacturing company. The facility, completed in 1905, was designed to manufacture chocolate using the latest mass production techniques. Hershey's milk chocolate quickly became the first nationally marketed product of its kind. In addition to the Hershey's bar, Hershey's Kisses came out in 1907 and the Hershey's Bar with Almonds in 1908. The chocolate factory was in the center of dairy farmland, which allowed Hershey to use fresh milk to mass produce quality milk chocolate. With Milton Hershey's financial support, houses, businesses, churches, roads, and schools were built around this area. And thus, Hershey, Pennsylvania was born. Then in 1963, something magical happened. Hershey's acquired the H.B. Reese Candy Company, and the merger of chocolate and peanut butter would go on to change my life. Today, Hershey, Pennsylvania is a chocolate-themed wonderland built on the simple capitalist history of a turn-of-the-century philanthropist and his chocolate bar for the masses. With my newfound knowledge and appreciation for the chocolate game, my next target was the flowers trade. It's off to the American heartland to find myself a flower farm. Valentine's Day is the single busiest day of the year for florists. According to the National Retail Federation, Americans will spend nearly $1.7 billion on flowers for that day alone. 78% of flowers purchased for Valentine's Day are cut flowers, half of which are long-stemmed roses. Mixed bouquets and carnations basically make up the other half. The farmlands of America are dotted with family farms and greenhouses full of flowers that supply our huge retail stores. Let's check this one out. Yeah, so I recently found out that uh, this particular greenhouse just sold out of its supply completely. So, good job, husbands of America. And uh, honey, you're welcome. They tell me this place was packed with flowers just a couple of weeks ago, but there are a few holidays each year that clean them out. Actually, here's a little secret. None of the estimated 200 million roses sold in the United States on Valentine's Day each year are grown in the United States. Since February 14th falls during the dead of winter, the flowers need to be imported from below the equator in South America, where it's summer. Our biggest imports of roses for Valentine's Day come from Ecuador and Colombia. There, now you know. Speaking of roses, they have long been the classic symbol of love and romance. Colors such as red, pink, and purple supposedly send different messages to the recipient. 
I've heard red means passionate love, pink means admiration, and purple means I will always love you. The Valentine's Day standard is a dozen red long-stemmed roses. However, now I hear a single stem means the recipient is, quote, the only one. Three roses stand for I love you. Eleven stems supposedly mean I'm the missing stem to make the dozen perfect. And three dozen roses mean my heart really belongs to you. <sighs> Come on. This all sounds like a lot of pressure to me. You gotta get the flower right. You gotta get the color right. You gotta get the number right. I think it's time to visit a friendly neighborhood florist to get the lowdown from a pro. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay, I'm Dave. Please, please help me. Of course. So my name's Catherine. Okay, hi Catherine. We'll walk into the coolers where all of our fresh wow. roses are. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to, to pick for my wife. I'm always the guy that at the end of the day on Valentine's Day, I go to the grocery store and I'm looking around and there's like half a dozen other panicked husbands like me. Yes. And I'm getting the leftovers. So help me, please make an arrangement for my wife. Definitely. So I would definitely do ombre. It'd be really pretty. Definitely impress her. Let's go ombre. Let's do ombre. Awesome. Okay. In full disclosure, I hadn't the foggiest idea what she was talking about. Does she have a specific color she, she likes? Uh, you think I would know this? I think let's just go with that. You know, I think by the end of this, Catherine, you and I are gonna be buds. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you definitely rose to the occasion, so. That's very true. See, at this point, it's really unromantic to ask how much all this is gonna cost. So when you get a huge rush of people for Valentine's Day, how do you stem the tide of that? So right now, this is the, the two dozen, and then we can go in and add in some more things to kind of make it pop yeah. a little bit. All right. And kind of add in a little bit more texture. Awesome. All right, let's go. So let's just add a few of these really pretty Gerber daisies. Then from there, um, to go with the peach, we can do some uh, stock. It's appropriate, because that's, that's how I first uh, dated my wife, was uh, I stalked her for a little while. Nothing says romance like a restraining order. This pink one really matches the roses. I like to add in a little hydrangea at the oh, bottom yeah. to give a lot of different textures since we're kind of ranging in a bunch of different things. And then once it is completed, you'll Beautiful. have something pretty impressive for your wife. That's awesome. I'm man enough to say it. <laughs> Captain, you're pretty fast at this. You're really uh, putting the pedal to the metal. <laughs> I still got it. I don't know how you're gonna get all those wrapped up in a one bouquet, but uh, don't stop believing. <laughs> Finally, I've got a bouquet that's worthy of my wife once and for all. I don't know how you've done this without me. Wow, you have to kind of hold it like a baby. That is, yes, you have wow. to hold it like a baby because you also have petals in the back. So if they... Yeah. Oh, right, they'll slide down. Check what she did here, the little extra touch. Actually, can we change the colors? Uh, is it too late? What's your name in case anybody wants to come into Dr. Delphinium and get a bouquet made by you? Um, full name, Catherine Flores. 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 Flores is a Spanish word for flowers. Look, I'm doing the puns around here. We're not buds anymore. So, we've got the history covered. We got the gifts covered. But what about the whole concept of asking that special someone to be your Valentine? Look, when it comes to dating, I was always a bit awkward. I really don't know why. I learned everything I know from the dating experts in health class at school. How do you choose a date? Woody thought of Janice and how good looking she was. Except, well, it's too bad Janice always acts so superior and bored. There's Betty, and yet it just doesn't seem as if she'd be much fun. What about Anne? She knows how to have a good time, 
and how to make the fellow with her relax, have fun too. Anne would be fun on a date. Hi, boys. Hi, Hi Coach. What's the big argument? Oh, Bill's kidding, George. He says he's scared to ask a girl to the winter party. You're scared to make a date, George? I never asked the girl to anything. Maybe you haven't, but you'll be wanting to someday. Look at it this way. Remember the first time you ever dived? Remember how you just knew you couldn't make that first plunge? But you did. After a morning of thinking it over, George decides to take the plunge. Hey, Mildred. Hi. Would you like to go to the party? You mean with you? Why, I guess so. That'd be okay. Bye. Bye. George did make the date. Awkward, maybe, but the date is made. Well, here it is, the dance night. Bill is well-groomed. That's the first step. His next problem is what to say when he gets to Helen's door. Bill wonders who's going to open the door. How do you do? I'm Bill Jenkins. I've come to call for Helen. Oh, yes. How do you do? Nice We've start. Been expecting you. Now let's do it again and suppose that Helen had opened the door. Hi, Helen. Gee, you look nice. Well, thank you. Do you like my new dress? Yeah. Well, come on in. Any honest compliment is tops in date etiquette. The secret of easy conversation is getting off to a good start. And here, the girl can often take the lead. My, did Mother and I have a time at the hairdressers today? Oh, it was so funny. And do you think this is a good start? Here they are at the party. And while it's certainly reasonable and fun to relax for a while and just stand around, nevertheless, all boy huddles and all girl huddles carried on too long can get to be a bore. Crossing that wide dance floor and asking a girl to dance can seem frightening. For party skill is gained by just one thing, by practice and more practice. I love you, Nora. Do you love me? Oh, I don't know, Jack. You're the only girl I've dated in, in two months. We get along fine. You do love me, don't you? I think so, but... I'll have to think about it. Mom, how did you know when you were in love with Dad? Oh, I've been in love several times before. I got so I could recognize the symptoms. You know, Bob, Nora's the prettiest girl I've ever known. She's just as beautiful as... Beautiful? And you think that's all that matters? The trouble with you is, you don't seem to understand what love is really about. Believe me. It's nothing like the slush they give you in the movies. Well, thanks so much. I had loads of fun. So did I. Good night, Woody. Night, Anne. Okay, so maybe these experts were a bit uh, out of date. Maybe I see why my dating game was a bit off. But in the end, isn't it all about the first glance? that undeniable spark, that special something, that feeling you get as if your heart has been pierced by Cupid's arrow. Come on. What would Valentine's Day be without Cupid? He's probably the most recognized symbol of dating and love in our pop culture today. But where did Cupid come from? Or as they say in superhero comics, what's his origin story? Well, in Greek mythology, he was first known as Eros, the son of Aphrodite. Later, in Roman mythology, his name was changed to Cupid, the son of Venus. Although there are a number of origin stories, one constant was that he was the son of the mythological goddess of love. Nice outfit, loser! <laughs> hey. In ancient poetry, Cupid was armed with a bow and a quiver of arrows. He had golden arrows to spark love and affection and lead arrows to ignite hatred and disgust. Cupid shot his arrows at the hearts of unsuspecting humans and mythological gods. 
He was a devious guy who played with the emotions of all his targets. In one myth, Cupid shot a golden arrow at Apollo, who fell madly in love with the nymph Daphne. And then he launched a lead arrow at Daphne so that she would be repulsed by Apollo. In another legend, Cupid's mother, Venus, became so jealous of the beautiful mortal Psyche that she told her son to use his arrows to make Psyche fall in love with a monster. But Cupid fell in love with Psyche and married her instead. It's a long story. You get the picture. Tom, have you noticed there's like everyone's crossing the street and walking on the other side? It's so hard to make friends in this town. In early mythology, Cupid was represented as a handsome immortal who was irresistible to both women and goddesses. But in later writings, he was increasingly portrayed as a mischievous child. It is this chubby, love-inducing cherub that has persisted in recent decades, becoming the pop culture mascot for Valentine's Day. Throughout history, great couples in love have filled poetry, literature, music, and art. They've caused wars and created empires. They've captured the hearts of the public. Romeo and Juliet might be the most famous love story of all. In fact, the couple has become synonymous with the term. But William Shakespeare met Romeo and Juliet as a tragedy. It's the tale of two teenagers from feuding families who risked everything for love. And in the end, they gave their lives for it. Not all great love stories end up being positive tales of true loving relationships. However, their influence on history and culture is powerful. Here's my brief run through of a few of them. When Paris, the handsome woman mad Prince of Troy saw Helen, the woman whom Aphrodite proclaimed the most beautiful in the world, he had to have her. Even though she was married, Helen and Paris fell in love and ran off together, setting in motion the 10-year Trojan War. Now, we don't really know if Helen of Troy actually existed, but we do know she played the romantic lead in the greatest mythology epic of all time. She will forever be known as the face that launched a thousand ships in the Trojan War. Cleopatra, queen of Egypt, was described as, quote, brilliant to look upon and to listen to with the power to subjugate everyone. She could have anything or anyone she wanted, but she fell in love with the Roman general Mark Antony. Shakespeare depicted their relationship as rather volatile. In one scene, Cleopatra said to Antony, fool, don't you see now that I could have poisoned you a hundred times had I been able to live without you? However, love won the day and they risked everything to fight a war together against Rome. In the end, they lost the war, but chose to die together in 30 BC. The love story of Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere is one of the best known legends of the medieval period. In short, Lancelot, the famous Knight of the Round Table, fell in love with King Arthur's wife, Guinevere. Their love grew slowly as they were careful to stay apart. But things heated up, and, well, one day they got caught together by some other knights. Lancelot escaped, but Guinevere was captured and condemned to death for committing adultery. Fear not, at the last moment, Lancelot came to the rescue and saved Guinevere from burning at the stake. But in the end, adultery always gets you into trouble, and the couple was forced to separate. Lancelot became a hermit, and Guinevere a nun. King Henry VIII fell for a young lady in waiting, Anne Boleyn, who possessed eyes, quote, black and beautiful. But the Tudor king was married to a Spanish princess, so he rocked the Western world when he staged a divorce and made Anne his queen. Ambassadors all over Europe couldn't believe how mesmerized the king was by his love for Anne. He wrote numerous love letters to her in the 16th century, where he spoke of being, quote, wounded by the dart of love. Oh, historical side notes, their love affair ended when Henry had Anne beheaded. Charming. 
One of my favorite positive examples of a couple in history is John and Abigail Adams. Abigail Smith married the founding father, John Adams, at age 20. She was his wife, confidant, and political advisor. They also had five children together, including America's sixth president, John Quincy Adams. The more than 1,000 letters they wrote to each other offer a window into the devotion and friendship they shared. Abigail wrote, there is a tie more binding than humanity and stronger than friendship. And by this cord, I am not ashamed to say that I am bound. John replied, I want to hear you think and see your thoughts. The conclusion of your letter makes my heart throb more than a cannonade. Now that's good stuff. Here are just a couple more. In the wedding of the century, American film star Grace Kelly left Hollywood behind at the height of her career to wed Prince Rainier and become Princess of Monaco. Prince Rainier fell in love with Grace when she visited the French Riviera to film Alfred Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief. He courted her through months and months of love letters before the couple announced their engagement in 1956. Prince Rainier never remarried after Grace's tragic death in 1982. There isn't a more iconic country music love story than Johnny Cash and June Carter. Both were stars in their own right when they met backstage at the famed Grand Ole Opry in Nashville, Tennessee. The couple went on to tour together and fell in love, eventually marrying in 1968. Cash credited Carter with helping him recover from drug addiction, further strengthening their bond. Both had successful careers, sharing a number of Grammy Awards. The happy couple stayed together their whole lives and died within four months of each other. It's clear this was a true love story. When once asked for his definition of paradise, Johnny Cash simply said, this morning, with her having coffee. And maybe my favorite power couple in the modern era, Ronald and Nancy Reagan. The famous actor, Charlton Heston, once said theirs was probably the greatest love affair in the history of the American presidency. What began as a meeting between two movie stars became a real life love story. The public saw a couple intensely devoted to one another. Ronald visibly lit up when Nancy entered the room and Nancy was known for her gaze when she looked adoringly at Ronald whenever he made public speeches. They were always holding hands. Ronald Reagan wrote countless letters to Nancy and Nancy hid cards and love notes for Ronnie whenever they were apart. In a letter to Nancy on their 31st wedding anniversary, he wrote, I more than love you. I'm not whole without you. You are life itself to me. When you are gone, I'm waiting for you to return so I can start living again. That is so good. I could definitely up my love letter game with examples like this. While some of these great couples in history didn't last long, others made it for decades. Some had impure motivations for their unions, while others experienced pure marital bliss. So what are some of the secrets to a long, happy marriage? Well, I know an actual great couple in my own family, my very own Uncle Denver and Aunt Thelma Lee. I recently got to set up a Zoom call with them where I had the pleasure of interviewing them about how they got together and all about their story. They've been married 73 years, and even though they're my aunt and uncle, I learned a few things. So Uncle Denver and Aunt Thelma Lee, when did you two get married? We got married in 1947. We have been married for 73 years. But yeah. it never seems that long. No, Dave, it don't seem like that long. It's a long time. Not sure my wife could handle 73 straight minutes of me. So Denver, you served in the Army back before you got married, is that right? I was drafted into the Army Air Corps, and I was uh, an instrument flying instructor 
using a flight simulator called a Link Trainer. And it maneuvered just like a plane. We taught the bomber pilots how to fly just on instruments. And that, that's what I did during World War II. After the war was over, my mother had told me I should go see Thelma Lee. I think we met at church and, and then we started dating. Now, important question, Denver. What car were you driving back then? Oh, it was a 42, a 42 Chevy, 42 Chevy. So what did you two do on dates? Well, there wasn't much to do. We went to basketball games, we had picnics, make a little popcorn or something like that. Denver, what were some of the qualities that you saw in Aunt Thelma Lee that made you want to pursue her? Wow. <laughs> well, she was a beautiful girl and she was kind of quiet and friendly, you know, and I thought, well, she'll be a fine lady to spend my life with. So, no, I was pretty lucky, pretty lucky. Now, did you guys hit it off immediately or did it take some time to get interested in one another? It didn't take too long. I know we went together three months and got married. Well, when you know, you know, you know? So, Denver, did you do anything elaborate to propose? It was pretty simple. Her sister was going to get married, so we were talking about her sister getting married, and we thought, well, why don't we just get married with them? And uh, so we, we decided that's what we'd do, so we did. So you guys piggybacked your wedding onto Aunt Ruth and Uncle Gene's wedding. How is it that I've never heard this story until now? Uh, I don't know. You should have, I, I guess. Thought everybody knew it. Yeah. Well, I was the youngest, so nobody ever told me anything. But it sounds like the decision to get hitched was sort of spur of the moment. Well, yes. Yeah. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. And here you are 73 years later. I never got down on my knees. <laughs> No. And then the four of us, we took off, went on our honeymoon, and we went to uh, the air races in Cleveland, Ohio. So for your honeymoon, you went to go watch a bunch of airplanes. That's like the best honeymoon idea I've ever heard of. It's kind of tailor-made for the husbands, though, wouldn't you agree, Denver? Yeah, it was, you yeah. know. So after the air show, we went back home, Back to work on the farm the next day. That was our honeymoon. So after 73 years of marriage, I think you guys have earned the right to give the, some advice to the rest of us. What is your secret for a long lasting marriage? When we got married, the word divorce wasn't in the dictionary yet. That was something that was never going to happen. So. Whenever we had a problem, we just work right through it. And we were always going to be together, you know. Aunt Thelma how would you describe love? Love is an action. They open the door for you. They put you first. Denver, what would you say? Love. God is love, that's where love came from, is to love God first, and then love others, and then love yourself last. Try to use those in perspective all your life, and I think you'll be practicing what love really is. My aunt and uncle are an incredible example of a great couple. What I think God intended for a long, loving marriage. Speaking of great couples and God's design for love and marriage, 
maybe we can learn something from the very first couple in history. According to the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve were the first humans, and all humans have descended from them. Adam and Eve were created by God to take care of his creation, to populate the earth, and to have a relationship with him. Their very names indicate their roles. In Hebrew, Adam comes from the word for man, and Eve comes from the word for life. In Genesis 2, we read, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Genesis 2, 20 through 24. Later in the New Testament, Jesus himself references Adam and Eve and God's design for marriage when he says, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Matthew 19, four through six. In this era of non-traditional relationships, unions, partnerships, and family units, it's nice to be reminded of God's clear design for marriage and parenting right from the beginning. Valentine's Day gets us talking about love. But what is love anyway? I mean, I love my wife, but I also love Tex-Mex food. I love my kids, but I also love a great action movie. So what do we really mean by biblical love, especially in a marriage? And what does a godly marriage really look like in the gritty world of the 21st century? To help answer these questions, I'm joined by Scott and Leah Silveri, a couple with a very great story, and some valuable insights. Welcome, you guys. I'm really glad you could be with me today. Yeah, we're so happy we're, to be here. Uh, we're huge fans of yours. Can you say a little bit louder? I'm not sure. We they, are, we're yeah. huge fans. <laughs> huge fans, okay. <laughs> Good, well, you guys have written a bunch of books. You speak regularly at marriage conferences. Give us a big, wide picture of how you guys met and what your story is. Sure, most of my career was, I worked over 26 years in law enforcement, and 12 of those were spent undercover. Uh, 16 and also were spent as a SWAT commander. And that's what led me to my doctoral research for, for police work, police culture. And he is a very, very humble guy, but he is the most interesting man in the world. Like Next to you. <laughs> Next Thank to you. Thank you. He... I was actually teaching um, on a textbook that I'd written about police operations, special operations, and I was invited to teach at a writer's conference. And, and I'm giving my spiel about my 12 years undercover. And, and at the end of it, this gorgeous young woman comes up and starts asking these very poignant questions. And of course I thought, you know, I'm a high flying chief of police with undercover experience. He thought that, that I was after more than I was, but. You really just wanted the I facts. I really just wanted, just his, wanted the facts. I just wanted his brain. Yeah, don't that flatter was, yourself, all right, Scott? <laughs> that, was, that was it. It's Valentine's Day. We're talking about love and marriage and relationships. Leah, give us a little bit of insight into what it's like being married to somebody, a first responder, somebody who I would imagine there were days that he would go off to work and you might think, mm -hmm. gosh, this could be the uh, last time I ever see him. I know that's a little bit of a cliche, right. but, but uh, given the fact that you were undercover, you were in SWAT, chief of police, that's a high profile position. It's a, a target on your back in some mm -hmm. way. So give us a little bit of what's, what's it like to be married to somebody like that? You know, it's not easy. It's yeah. uh, it's difficult, and and I talk to to police wives all the time, and they live in a constant state of fear and anxiety. And God did not give us that spirit uh, that mm -hmm. spirit of fear. And um, you know, we talk about stewardship, and when you you talk about stewardship, people immediately think money, but right. that's not true. You know, like we are to steward everything that God gives us. You know, from our spouse to our children to the home we live in. It all belongs you know, to it God. It all belongs right. to right. God. And when you look at it that way, you know, when He walks out the door, I trust God to protect Him at all times, 
and that whatever happens, you know, I mean, it's the same thing as putting your kid on a school bus. You know, God's got this, right. you know. You know, people talk a lot about um, inviting Jesus into their marriage context, but what does that look like kind of in a, at a practical level? God created marriage. He created the design of marriage to, so you could share that intimacy mm -hmm. with Him. And of course, the, the advantage of the model that He created is that we replicate that with our spouse. Mm -hmm. So in a very tangible way, like you said, is it's to, it's to replicate the way God loves us, that we're to serve and, and love our spouse. Mm -hmm. So that's where we, when we learn to implement that, when we really learn what a, what a covenant marriage was, and it's, it's my wife, myself, and God at the center, then we began to be able to model the way God loves us, that we love each other. And, and I mean, we were on the brink for about the mm -hmm. first year, uh, totally unmet expectations, yeah. wondering, doubting, like how are we gonna get out of this mess? Until we invited God into the center. Paul but, says, husbands love your wives as yes. Christ loved the church. That's a high bar. Meeting the needs that you know they're having, even when they're not telling you, that's not an easy thing to do. Like, I love that passage because it does. It says, you know, husbands, love your wives. And it doesn't say if you feel like it, if she deserves right. it. You know, it says love your wives. If and, she meets me halfway. Right. Or right. She, and, if she deserves it yeah, or earned it. That's right. Oh. And, and same thing for, for women. It says respect your husbands. You know, and these are two things that we are not great at without the Holy Spirit. If, if God is the center, if if he's in the middle of everything, the priorities in your life are gonna automatically fall into place. Yeah. You know, each other next, then your children, then your work, you yeah. know, and, and church and things like that. And a lot of times, especially in ministry, especially with our children, you know, we have a tendency to put other things first. Right. And really, you know, your kids are a temporary assignment. That's right. right. You know, the goal is to raise them up to, to maturation and then, then send them off. Yeah. Uh, but your, your marriage, your marriage is designed by God when it's a covenant marriage mm -hmm. to last forever. And, and so we always tell people, there's a 100% chance of your marriage succeeding if you enter into a covenant with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So somebody said uh, to me one time, procrastination means never having to say you're sorry. I think it's uh, hilarious and the do. most terrible advice I've ever heard. What, what is the best marriage advice that you've ignored? No, that <laughs> was the best marriage advice that you've taken. I think the best marriage advice I've ever gotten is to stop praying for your spouse to change to pray for yourself to change first. That's good. Because, I mean, That's I can good. pray all day long that, that Scott learns to, you know, close the cabinet doors or what, you know, those yeah. little things that add up that were cute when you were dating but are annoying when yeah. you're married, yeah. you know, but, but there are things like we have the, the ability and the power in each other to change each other's behavior. You know, like when one of us has stress or anxiety, like having that calm spirit in the mm -hmm. other can, can completely change my behavior and, and vice versa. So I, earn, I learned early on, especially that first year of our marriage, you know, what can I do, God, yeah. that mm -hmm. can change my behavior that can help him? I love, it's, it's 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14, and, and, and I, it's particularly for men, but it says, be strong, um, you know, stand firm, act like men, and in all you do, do in love. And oftentimes we men forget that, th that second part of the scripture mm -hmm. and all we do, do in love. Mm -hmm. So in that loveness is kindness that you should show to each other yeah. all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank you guys so much for being here and giving us a little bit of your insight into love and uh, Valentine's Day. So thank happy you. Valentine's Day. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day. There are at least four different Greek words that are used for love. The first is eros, which refers to romantic or physical love. From it, we get the word erotic. The second is storge, which refers to familial love, like that of a mother for her baby, or a brother and sister for each other. The third is philia, which refers to friendship and camaraderie. This word is often translated as friend, one who is loved in the New Testament. It's also why they call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love. And then there is agape, used to speak of God's love and the love that we are called to imitate in our lives and marriages. Although selfless service to another, dying to oneself, is a very difficult standard to follow, it's what we're called to try and emulate as Christians. When it comes to agape in a relationship, one of the greatest examples in the Bible is the story of Ruth and Boaz.
The love story of Ruth and Boaz is one of the most moving accounts in the Bible. It begins with an Israelite family living in the land of Moab over 3,000 years ago. Originally from Bethlehem, the family was forced to leave their homeland because of a terrible famine. But more tragedy soon followed, leaving a woman named Naomi and her Moabite daughter-in-law, Ruth, as widows. Now, it's hard for us living in the 21st century to comprehend the hopeless situation in which the women found themselves. They were cast out of their clan and thus cut off from its protection, provision, and community. In the ancient Near East, options for such women were few. Naomi decided to return to Israel after the famine was over. She was a survivor, but she returned with nothing. Ruth loved Naomi and decided to go along, leaving Moab behind and putting her fate in the hands of the Israelites. In a gesture of total trust and selfless love, Ruth movingly tells Naomi, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. But in Bethlehem, Ruth was an outcast, focused solely on survival. She spent her days in harvested barley fields, looking for leftovers to feed her and Naomi. One day she met Boaz, the owner of a field who showed her kindness and compassion. Over time, Boaz learned about Ruth's humble situation and offered her food and safety in his fields. In the midst of struggle, a love affair developed. I'll spare you the details, but it turns out that Boaz was a relative of Ruth's deceased husband. And according to Jewish law, he had the right to step in and take care of the foreign widow. Boaz made a commitment in front of Bethlehem's town leaders that he would act as Ruth's kinsman redeemer and marry her. Boaz and Ruth were married and soon had a son named Obed. Misfortune had turned to joy. But this story goes much deeper than the love shared between two people. In the midst of struggle, God was orchestrating an amazing plan that generations later would affect all of humanity. You see, Obed went on to be the grandfather of King David, who was a direct ancestor of Jesus Christ. That meant that Ruth, a foreigner, was the great grandmother of Israel's heroic king. Incredibly, after God used Israel to redeem Ruth, she joined in the mission to redeem others. Her marriage to Boaz demonstrated that a foreigner could be completely assimilated into God's family and become his instrument for redeeming the world. Over 1,000 years later, Ruth and Boaz appeared in the genealogical line of Jesus at the beginning of the New Testament. Jesus Christ descended from David's family in both blood through his mother Mary and legal kinship through his father Joseph. This ancestry gave Jesus legitimacy as Israel's Messiah, while Ruth's role made it clear that the Messiah would redeem all of humanity, not just the Jewish people. In the end, Boaz was a model for Christ when he became the kinsman redeemer for Ruth. As a demonstration of agape love, Boaz brought Ruth into the family of God's people by paying the price for her redemption, just as Jesus Christ paid the price for us on the cross. The New Testament tells us that Jesus redeemed us, purchased us with the price of his shed blood in order that we might become part of the eternal family of God. Isn't it incredible how God's love works in and through all circumstances, even when things feel rather hopeless and don't make any sense at the time? Like many special days in America, St. Valentine's Day has its history and its traditions. We covered the gamut from European saints to American chocolates, mythological Cupid to biblical agape. Regardless of its current position in pop culture, Valentine's Day is still a great opportunity to reconnect to God's design for true love and lasting marriages. For me, the greatest example of agape is God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to save mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believeth in him 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now that is an incredible reason to celebrate Valentine's Day.